Welcome to Selfless Part 2, The Great Controversy Begins. In Part 1, we saw that selflessness is the only sustainable thing. No laws, policies, or plans, however noble, will ever achieve peace in this world so long as selfishness reigns in the hearts of men. A change of the heart is what is required, and this change God alone can accomplish. We saw that God's law, the Ten Commandments, is the secret behind the sustainability, peace, and harmony of heaven, because at the heart of this law is selflessness. We also saw what the Bible calls sin is simply selfishness because sin is transgression of this law. Perhaps the most simplified explanation of the Bible and the entire premise of the Christian faith is that man's nature is fallen and becomes selfish and the entire plan of salvation is God's plan to restore man from selfishness to his original character of selfless love. It is time we all understood the conflict between selfishness and selfless love warring within each of us is the cause of the great controversy warring in the world around us. Just last week, over 10,000 protested throughout Israel. Actually attack Iran militarily. say they live in fear. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living, rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. People of all classes of life now foresee the crisis point fast approaching and are taking measures to prepare for it. Jesus saw men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Many are stockpiling gold, water, and food and preparing off-grid shelters to withstand anything that might come their way. But in this, many make a grave mistake not understanding the nature of this war or the reason for the coming crisis or the things with which they will have to contend, they fail to make the only preparations that will secure their safety and victory. They do not see that the purpose of the coming crisis is to polarize the world into two groups, the wheat and the tares, the selfless and the selfish. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, Jesus said, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The coming crisis will bring all seeds to maturity and show of what character we really are, and then the world will be reaped. Rather than preparing a safer home in this world, we ought to be preparing a selfless character fit to dwell in the world to come. If we are to understand the cure for selfishness, we must understand the cause. For when we acknowledge the source of selfishness, we will better understand what we need to conquer it. As we investigate the origin of selfishness, we will go back in time thousands of years, even before the creation of the earth. We must go back further to the time when the Bible reveals there was war in heaven. Lucifer might have remained in favor with God, beloved and honored by all the angelic host, exercising his noble powers to bless others and to glorify his maker. But, says the prophet, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Little by little, Lucifer came to indulge a desire for self-exaltation. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections and allegiance of his creatures, it was Lucifer's endeavor to win their service and homage to himself. 
and coveting the honor which the infinite Father had bestowed upon his Son, this Prince of Angels aspired to power which it was the prerogative of Christ alone to wield. All heaven had rejoiced to reflect the Creator's glory and to show forth his praise, and while God was thus honored, all had been peace and gladness. But a note of discord now marred the celestial harmonies. The service and exaltation of self, contrary to the Creator's plan, awakened forebodings of evil in minds to whom God's glory was supreme. It was Lucifer's position at the throne of God to bear the light of God's glory, which is his character of selfless love to the inhabitants of heaven. This is what his name Lucifer means, light bearer. In order to share the glory of God with the creation, Lucifer was one of the two exalted cherubim that dwelt in the very presence of God at his throne. And we see this in the sanctuary model. When Moses was instructed to make an earthly model of the heavenly throne, God told Moses to make an ark and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. As one of these covering cherubim, it was Lucifer's position to cover or protect the testimony of the Ten Commandments inside the ark. The Ark of the Covenant is God's throne, and we see in this verse the very foundation of his throne is the Ten Commandments. As we saw in part one, the foundational principle of the Ten Commandments is a selfless love. Therefore, Paul wrote, love is the fulfilling of the law. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The Ten Commandments are the laws of selfless love. Selflessness is the foundation of God's throne, and because God's law is the foundation of his throne, we know that selfless love is the ruling principle of God's government, and everything God does and every decision he makes is but an expression of his selfless love for all the beings he has made. This law of selflessness inside the ark, that is, the very same law Lucifer was to cover and protect, was now the law he sought to eliminate. In its place, Lucifer proposed a new order of government. He said in his heart, I will exalt my throne. Now what is different about Lucifer's throne? In Psalms 94, the Bible says, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? The principle of Satan's throne is that it is based on iniquity, which is sin, and sin is selfishness. So here we see Lucifer is declaring that he will abandon God's throne and God's kingdom which is based on selfless love so that he may set up his own throne and his own kingdom based upon the principle of selfishness. Imagine Lucifer spreading his thoughts to the angels, telling them God's law is a violation of their freedom and that if they would rebel with him, they would be freed from the law and thus able to render to God a nobler and purer service of love. Lucifer did not insinuate that his government would abolish love. On the contrary, he believed it would promote it. I will be like the Most High, he said. And according to the scriptures, the Most High is benevolent and selfless. God is love. Lucifer knew open rebellion against God would not win him many allies, so he concealed his rebellion with the garb of love. He was professing to be like the God of love, yet without obedience to his law. He professed to be seeking to promote the stability of the divine government while secretly bending every effort to secure its overthrow. To advance his case, imagine Lucifer casting contempt upon the Creator, distorting his words, misrepresenting his purposes, and at last telling the angels and all the inhabitants of heaven that God himself imposes his law upon them for selfish purposes to keep his subjects under the tyranny of his control. To win the angels to his side, Satan could use what God could not, flattery and deceit. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government before the angels, claiming that God was not just in laying laws and rules upon the inhabitants of heaven, that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. Therefore, it must be demonstrated before the inhabitants of heaven, as well as of all the worlds, that God's government was just, his law perfect. 
Satan had made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real object must be understood by all. He must have time to manifest himself by his wicked works. Keep in mind the universe had never before witnessed any evil. Death did not exist and the angels had never heard a lie. So when Lucifer made his grand accusations against God, the angels didn't know if Lucifer was telling the truth or not. With God's own character under attack and the crime of selfishness charged upon him, it would not be sufficient for God to simply say that he is not selfish. Nor would it be sufficient for Satan to merely proclaim his throne is superior. Only one thing will forever settle the dispute and reveal which form of government is able to produce and preserve love, and that is a demonstration. He, that is Lucifer, claimed that it was his own object to improve upon the statutes of Jehovah. Therefore, it was necessary that he should demonstrate the nature of his claims and show the working out of his proposed changes in the divine law. His own work must condemn him. Satan had claimed from the first that he was not in rebellion. The whole universe must see the deceiver unmasked. Is Lucifer right? Is selfishness a pure form of love? Is the law of selflessness imposed upon the universe by God really for selfish reasons, or is it for the good of his creation and to ensure its sustainability? People always ask, if God is love and if God is all-powerful, why didn't he just destroy Satan immediately? And here we find the answer to this question. If God had destroyed his adversary in an instant, it would not quell the rebellion, it would ignite it. To destroy Satan before his accusations could be proven false would only fuel the doubts of the angels and give evidence that Lucifer's accusations against God might really be true. The only way for God to put any doubts about his love beyond all question would be for him to prove that he is love, and this would require a demonstration. A demonstration of selflessness so grand and so epic that the question of God's selfless love would be settled in the minds of all created beings for the rest of eternity. Thus it was that Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory, the attendant of his throne, by transgression became Satan, the adversary of God and holy beings, and the destroyer of those whom heaven had committed to his guidance and guardianship. And he promised those who would enter his ranks a new and better government under which all would enjoy freedom. And so it was, the discord among the angels of God broke into open rebellion, and there was war in heaven. To preserve the loyalty of heaven's inhabitants and open before them the true nature of Satan's propositions, God must allow Satan to demonstrate his proposed changes. Satan must be allowed an opportunity to demonstrate his principles of government are superior and that God's law is unnecessary. Men and angels must see for themselves the end result of Satan's policies. For this, Satan would need to found a new kingdom based upon his principles and impose them upon a race of beings willing to obey them. And for this grand experiment, he found an opportunity upon the earth. Lucifer in heaven desired to be first in power and authority. He wanted to be God, to have rulership of heaven, and to this end he won many of the angels to his side. When with his rebel host he was cast out from the courts of God, the work of rebellion and self-seeking was continued on earth. War had broken out in heaven, but this war was far from over. The battleground had spread to the earth. Lucifer had accomplished his objective. He successfully separated mankind from his creator by getting man to commit a selfish act, which is sin, and here is how it happened. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Lucifer found that by asserting doubts about the character of God in heaven, he was successfully able to win many angels to his side. 
and his poisonous assertions met with no less success in the garden upon the earth. By doubting God's word, the devil had created a fertile soil in which new ideas about God could be entertained. And with this, he then suggested a new thought. This new idea would lay the foundation for the outworking of his government upon the earth to the close of time. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In the words, ye shall be as gods, was embedded the principle of the service of self. Satan's long-standing premise is that God is selfish, and his temptation was calculated to persuade humanity to believe his lie. Should Adam and Eve eat from the forbidden tree, Satan said, ye shall be as gods, meaning that instead of continually serving God and others according to the selfless nature that God had given them, they would be changed and receive a fallen sinful nature and would therefore, as Satan insinuated, be as gods, because then they would be able to live for and unto themselves. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, but if it was good for food, why would God command her not to eat of it? The command of God was not about the food, it was about demonstrating their loyalty. As Adam and Eve chose not to eat from the tree, they were demonstrating a selfless surrender to the will of God, whom they loved. It was a demonstration of their allegiance, their servitude, their commitment, and their love to their Creator. But when the serpent introduced to Eve the temptation to do something for herself in spite of what God had asked, she obeyed and committed the first sin by serving herself and following her own will above the will of God. Then Adam followed suit, but Adam's sin was somewhat different because we are told that Adam was not deceived. This means Adam knew the penalty of selfishness was death, and therefore he also knew his wife was certain to die. So if Adam knew death would be the result, why did he eat of the fruit? The only logical conclusion is that he loved his wife and rather than be separated from her, he would join her in death. Adam yielded to the temptations of his wife. He could not endure to be separated from her. He ate and fell from his integrity. Neither the glory of the earth in its infancy, nor his own life was more dear to him than his beloved wife. And choosing to be with Eve in death, he demonstrated that his love for his wife superseded his love for God. By following his own will in the place of the will of God, he chose to serve himself. In eating from the tree, he failed the test of loyalty, which was forever to be a demonstration of his selfless love for God. And from that day, the stain of selfishness and its terrifying results have continued to plague every inhabitant of earth unto this day. So it was that on this earth, Satan found a race of beings that would subject themselves to his inclinations, to his insinuations, and serve themselves that they might be as gods. It's a total escapist fantasy. Everyone is here for a good time. From Grandma Joe to movie stars. Through the temptation to selfish indulgence and ambition, Satan accomplished the fall of our first parents. And from that time to the present, the gratification of human ambition and the indulgence of selfish hopes and desires have proved the ruin of mankind. Even more significant than the lives of two people, there is something you need to understand about the legal ramifications of mankind's sin. As head of the human race, Adam was the legal representative of planet Earth. To him, his wife, and their successors, God had given dominion over all the earth. When Adam sinned, he lost his legal right to the earth, when by disobeying God and obeying the devil, he gave his loyalty to Satan. In Adam's place, Satan was now the new prince of the planet, as Jesus himself said when he referred to Satan as the prince of this world, and the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians chapter 2. 
Speaking to those in Pergamos, Jesus said, Thou dwellest even where Satan's seat is. Satan has set up his seat, that is to say, his throne upon the earth. No human being had come into the world and escaped the power of the deceiver. And so long as the entire human race continued to obey his dictates by following their selfish inclinations, his rulership of earth would remain uncontested. But wait, because this is not the end of our story. Adam and Eve had become selfish, and their children exhibited the same characteristics. On a small scale, the conflict between Cain and Abel is in itself a representation of the war over worship that began in heaven. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And when the time came to worship the Lord and offer a sacrifice, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Rather than provide the sacrifice the Lord had specified, Cain offered fruit and vegetables. He decided he would sacrifice what he wanted to give instead of what God had asked for. By this offering, Cain revealed that what he was willing to give was more important than what God had required. In short, it was a selfish act. Both Cain and Abel had offered a sacrifice as an act of worship, but only one was accepted because only in the offering of Abel was a selfless love for God demonstrated. And by offering what he was willing to give, and not what God had asked for, Cain demonstrated that he loved himself more than he loved God. Selfishness ruled his heart, and God rejected his offering. If our worship is stained with selfishness by what we hope to get from God more than what we hope to give, our worship is no more acceptable than the offering of Cain. When Cain's offering was rejected, he was furious, and the selfishness he already fostered culminated in the act of murder. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Selfishness knows no bounds. Adam and Eve must have wept terribly at the death of their firstborn son, as it was also the first time they had witnessed the death of a human being. This must have left an indelible impression in Adam's mind as he saw for the first time the consequence of his own selfish sin, resulting in the death of his firstborn son. A lesson that would forever enable Adam to better understand the heart of God and what sin would require of his only begotten son. There is one more important lesson for us in Cain's response to God after Abel's death. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? Many are asking the same question today. The selfish heart says, I have only myself to look out for. It's not my responsibility to consider the wants or needs of others. But this is the mindset of Cain. Think about it. Even by neglecting to consider the needs of others, we are allying ourselves with the world's first murderer. The apostles wrote, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Selflessness is the meaning of life because selflessness is what gives life meaning. The world's first murder was committed by a selfish man who hated his brother because he worshiped God according to his commandments. This is an important story to note because this story will be repeated at the end of time on a global scale. There will be men and women unwilling to worship God in the way he specified and their selfishness will ultimately lead them to murder those who worship God according to his commandments. As Jesus warned, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. The Apostle John also spoke of this time and wrote that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. We just read the story of the first murder, and these prophecies tell us about the last murder. The first murder ever committed was over the issue of worship, and the last murder ever committed will also be over the matter of worship. And the character we foster in this life will, to a large degree, determine whether we will follow in the footsteps of Cain or Abel. Regarding the end of time, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In the days of Noah, nearly the entire world had become infected with selfishness. So much so that if left unchecked, selflessness would have been vanquished from the earth. Let's move forward to the year 2298 BC and take a closer look at the days of Noah.
Nearly the entire race consisted of men and women who lived to please themselves, and we see this in the following verse. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What was it about the thoughts of the wicked that made them so evil? In Psalms 10 and verse 4, we're given some insight into the thoughts of the wicked. It says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. When it says God is not in all his thoughts, it is saying that God is not in any of his thoughts. In other words, they were living to serve and worship themselves. This quote really sums it up when it says, In the days that were before the flood, men left God out of their reckoning and followed the imagination of their own hearts until violence and cruelty, selfishness and self-exaltation were the order of the day. The flow of every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only selfish continually. Mankind was at a critical stage. The plague of selfishness had corrupted every individual upon the earth. Every individual, that is, except for Noah and his family. Should God have chosen not to send a flood, then selflessness would have perished from the earth when Noah and his family gave up their last breath. Love would have become extinct, and therefore God gave mankind a choice. Separate from selfishness by acknowledging the laws of love and enter into the ark, or refuse to depart from selfishness and perish along with it. God did not want to destroy men. He wanted to destroy selfishness. And it was because he did not want to destroy man that he gave mankind a chance to separate from selfishness. God said to Noah, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. According to this text, when Noah and his family entered the ark, it was synonymous with their entering into a covenant with God. And this covenant, according to Genesis chapter 9, was the everlasting covenant. This is significant because God is inviting us into the covenant today. He says, Incline your ear and come unto me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. This everlasting covenant is God's answer to the selfishness that filled the earth in the days of Noah. When God said every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the problem was with the thoughts of man's mind and the condition of his heart. Now watch how God's covenant goes right to the source of the problem. He says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. The foundational principle of selfless love at the heart of the Ten Commandments, God promised to write in our hearts and minds, of course, with the objective of changing us into selfless people. This is expressed in Peter's words, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is, by the promise of the everlasting covenant, we, like Noah, may become partakers of the divine nature of selfless love, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, which is selfish desires. Instead of being selfish continually, God has promised to undertake the work of making us selfless continually. Therefore, it was to preserve benevolence and altruism upon the earth that God sent a flood. Selflessness was nearly removed from the earth, and its preservation demanded God's intervention. So it was, the earth was cleansed of selfishness, and from the men who refused to separate from it. This is not just an old story. It is a lesson for this generation, listening to the sound of my voice before the final judgments fall in the form of the seven last plagues. You are being invited into the ark of the everlasting covenant. However, even after the flood, the plague of selfishness was not contained, but rather continued to spread over the earth as soon as the waters dried up. And this brings us to the year 2197 BC. Mankind's selfish nature was once again exhibited by constructing a monument to selfishness, the Tower at Babel.
And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The people wanted to exalt and make a name for themselves. Consider how closely this parallels the aspirations of Lucifer. For God said to Lucifer, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In seeking to build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven above the heights of the clouds and make a name for themselves, they were living out the selfish aspirations of Satan's own heart. But what was the result of Satan's effort to exalt himself? God said, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Lucifer's self-exaltation will result in his demise. In fact, his death sentence is declared by God in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Many people believe Satan will live for all eternity, tormenting people in hell. But his death sentence is clear. He is brought to ashes upon the earth, and never shalt thou be any more, said the Lord. In other words, the time is coming when he will cease to exist. Now, in contrast to Lucifer's fall, consider the life of Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Even being equal with God, Jesus humbled himself. He became a man and was perfectly obedient to the will of the Father. He literally humbled himself to death. And what was the result of his selfless sacrifice? Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The very position and objective Lucifer and the builders at Babel sought to obtain by self-exaltation, that is making a name for themselves, Jesus received by humbling himself. Lucifer's example teaches us that self-exaltation will result in eternal death and self-sacrifice will result in eternal life. Self-renunciation is the great law of self-preservation, and self-preservation is the law of self-destruction. Jesus plainly told us about this law when he said, Whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And when he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. These principles are directly opposed to the logic of selfish men and women. How many today are seeking prosperity, pleasure, popularity, power, and prestige by trying to make a name for themselves? Such are following in the footsteps of the builders of Babel, striving for the heavens while their most valiant efforts will meet with the same inevitable results. The schemes of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The monument to their pride became the memorial of their folly, Yet men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon self and rejecting God's law. The word Babel means confusion, and like the builders of the ancient tower, many today are likewise confused about salvation, thinking that by exalting themselves and attaining to a high, ennobled, or enlightened position by their own effort and their own works, that they can save themselves from the inevitability of an eternal death. It was to such that Jesus said, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Self-renunciation is the law of self-preservation. And this is why the road that leads to eternal life is narrow, and few there be that find it. It is only through humility and the surrender of self that we can become citizens of the heavenly kingdom. This is the lesson that God would have us take away from the builders of the Tower of Babel. Their shame, their defeat, and the memorial of their folly is a warning to all succeeding generations not to follow in their footsteps.
One of the best examples in all of the Bible to illustrate how this epic war is taking place in everyday lives of ordinary people is the story of Job. The story of Job takes place about 120 years after the Tower of Babel. The Bible says about Job, his substance was also 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Job was a very rich man. He didn't know it, but this was about to change. It did not change because of anything Job did wrong. It changed because of a controversy that was taking place in heaven between Satan and God. When tragedy strikes and people suffer, they wonder how a selfless and loving God could permit this to happen. So here is one story, at least, where the veil is removed and we are allowed to witness the tragedy from God's point of view in heaven. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Before we get into the meaning of this, let's first look at who the sons of God are and get a real context for the epic intergalactic council that is taking place here. Consider this, there are two sons of God in the Bible. Most notably, one is Jesus Christ, who is the only begotten Son of God, and the other Son of God, through creation, is Adam. Luke wrote about Adam's son, Seth, saying that he was the son of Adam, which was the Son of God. So Adam is called the Son of God in the sense that he was created by God directly himself. Adam was the first man. He was the chief representative of the human race, and to him God gave dominion of all the earth. So too in this heavenly council, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, God is telling us the first beings that God made in all the other worlds in the universe came to gather themselves together before the Lord. As the first created beings of their kind, they came as representatives before their worlds. So hold on, you're probably wondering, did God make other worlds with other beings? The answer is yes. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. The word worlds is plural, telling us that this world, earth, is not the only world Jesus made. Now, one might be tempted to think the word worlds could be a mistake, but Jesus said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And we find a second witness in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds, plural, were framed by the word of God. The Word of God is Jesus Christ, and it is He who created the other worlds also in addition to our own. So now picture this. There is a heavenly council where all the sons of God are gathered together before the Lord as representatives of all the various worlds that Jesus made. With this type of gathering in mind, consider the significance of the words of verse 6. Satan came also among them. What is Satan doing at a gathering of representatives from all the worlds? God asks him this question directly. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. In this statement, Satan was claiming to hold Adam's rightful position as representative of planet earth. You see, the Bible declares, To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. And when Adam chose to obey Satan, Adam became his property. Through sin, Adam became the servant of Satan, and all that belonged to Adam, along with the dominion of the earth and his position as a son of God and representative of the human race, was transferred to Satan, his new owner. For this reason, Satan saw he had a right to be at this meeting in heaven and claimed his presence at the heavenly council was legitimate. But by the words, Whence comest thou, God challenged Satan's claim. And by Satan's response, going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it, he was speaking of his authority over the earth, and by this was making the argument that the dominion of the earth was now his to claim. But God challenged Satan's claim once again. 
And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Consider what God is revealing by these words. He is showing us that so long as one soul upon the earth obeys God and has not yielded his will to Satan, then Satan has no right to represent the planet. Satan apparently had not considered Job. Don't miss what's happening here. Of all the inhabitants of the earth, only one man stood between Satan and the control of the planet that he desired. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Do you see what Satan is arguing now? Satan is saying the earth is under his control on the basis that Job is worshiping God for selfish reasons. By the words, doth Job fear God for naught, Satan is inferring that Job is worshiping God because of all the riches, the wealth, and the prosperity that God has given him, and that Job is therefore worshiping God for selfish reasons. And to prove his case, Satan suggests a challenge. He said to God, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Just think about what's happening here. The legitimacy of Lucifer's complete dominion of the earth came down to proving the motive of one man's worship. Was Job's worship of God selfish or selfless? The answer to this question would prove whether God or Lucifer was telling the truth about the ownership of the earth. So it was not merely Job that was on trial here, it was God. And Lucifer had just called him to task by issuing a challenge. God responded, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Without delay, Satan took away from Job all that he could, and here is how it happened. There was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. In one day, all at one time, the news came to Job that all his riches were gone and all his sons had died. It is in a crisis that character is revealed, and now it would be seen of what character a man Job really was. Would he selfishly curse God for taking away his possessions and family as Lucifer suggested? We read, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job sinned not, which we know means Job did not transgress the law of selfless love, by committing a single selfish act. Still, it did not end here. The controversy continued and Job was inflicted with boils from head to toe. To relieve his suffering, his wife told him to curse God and die, meaning she was implying that he should commit suicide, to which Job responded, Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? The act of suicide to relieve his own affliction would have been a selfish act, but to this proposition, Job declared of God, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job believed God was selfless, and no matter what God was doing or what God was allowing to happen, 
that all things work together for good for them that love God and them who are called according to his purpose. Job knew God intimately, and it was because Job knew God so well that his faith did not waver or falter. And through all this, Job held fast to his integrity and to his selfless character. Finally, at the end of the ordeal, Job did something that put an end to the controversy. We read in chapter 42 and verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Amidst all his own suffering, loss, and pain, Job's selfless heart reached unto heaven on behalf of his friends. The challenge was over. Lucifer's accusations that Job's worship was motivated by selfishness had been shown to be false. God was shown to be true, and Lucifer a liar. Are you a Christian? How do you respond to suffering or loss? Will you look to yourself and your overwhelming circumstances and curse God? Or does your trust in the selfless and sovereign character of God run deeper than mere emotions? Will you turn away from Him? Or will you fall down on your knees and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord? We do not always know the reasons why tragedy strikes, but while circumstances may change, God's love does not. It may be that heaven is depending on you to vindicate the character of God before the onlooking universe. We would be well to better understand the story of Job, for this story is to be repeated at the end of time in the lives of those who claim to obey God and be his servants. In this controversy between God and Satan, it was not Job alone that was on trial. The character of God was on trial before all the universe. But according to his faith, so it was unto Job. When he hath tried me, he said, I shall come forth as gold. So it came to pass, by his patient endurance, he vindicated his own character, and thus the character of him whose representative he was. From the story of a rich, selfless man, we move 1,615 years into the future, and we come to the story of another rich man, living at the height of the wealthiest kingdom to ever have existed. But unlike Job, this rich man was perhaps one of the most selfish men on earth at the time. This man is none other than the king of Babylon himself, King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was magnificent. It was the epicenter of learning and culture. The hanging gardens of Babylon are still today considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's believed that the tiered gardens of trees, shrubs, and vines, watered by machinery, resembled a green mountainside and was a feat of engineering. Picture the sun's evening rays setting upon the golden city of wealth and grandeur. Now imagine Nebuchadnezzar walking out on his terrace overlooking the city and uttering these words. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Without a doubt, this is a prideful, arrogant, and selfish, self-centered man. When the king said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the honor of my majesty, he was equating the value of the kingdom with his own value as a man. And how many of us, still today, whether rich or poor, perceive that our value as an individual is proportionate to the wealth we have acquired or the projects we have accomplished? It was because he believed the building of the city gave him value as a man that the dream he had about the kingdom troubled him so much. Why does it fill me with dread? In Daniel chapter 2, the king received this dream about Babylon, but he wouldn't know how troubling it would be until the prophet Daniel told him its meaning, because the dream concerned the deterioration of his kingdom. Summoned before the king, Daniel spoke and explained to the king his dream. He said, There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And again in verse 29, Daniel said, These things concerned what should come to pass hereafter. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream was about the future. Then Daniel continued, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, 
and break them to pieces. Daniel explained to the king that this image showed how the kingdom of Babylon would not last forever, but would be succeeded by inferior kingdoms, as much as silver is inferior to gold and brass to silver, and eventually the kingdom would be destroyed. Then Daniel's next words revealed why Nebuchadnezzar was so terrified. Daniel said, You are that head of gold. Here was a prophecy foretelling the fall of Babylon to the Medes and the Persians represented by the silver followed by Greece, represented as the belly and thighs of brass, which was followed by Rome, and the split between the eastern and western kingdoms of Rome, represented as the legs of iron, which was followed by the feet and the ten toes, representing the fall of Rome into the ten tribes that made up its territories. The thought of Babylon disintegrating with time plagued Nebuchadnezzar's selfish heart, but this wasn't all of the dream. Daniel would tell him next about the last kingdom represented by the stone that destroyed the entire image. This revelation would wound the selfish pride of the king like nothing else. Daniel added, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. During the time of those kings, the God who rules from heaven will set up an eternal kingdom that will never fall. In an act of prideful retaliation against what appeared to be a wretched revelation, Nebuchadnezzar immediately set out to create a gigantic statue of the very image he had seen in his dream, with one major change. He made the entire statue all out of gold. It was a bold statement. The king was saying Babylon would not be left to other people. He was saying Babylon would last forever and never be destroyed. It was an act of defiance. Behold this glorious creation of mine, how it watches over all of Babylon. Now I've taken the time to go through this whole story for a specific reason. I want you to clearly see and understand the deep-seated desire of Nebuchadnezzar's selfish heart was to create a kingdom that would last forever. This was the chief desire of his selfish heart. Think about this for a moment. Isn't this exactly what our global society is seeking to accomplish today? Are not many of the world's leaders, thinkers, scientists, researchers, kings and presidents trying to understand how to create a sustainable world, a sustainable economy, a sustainable environment? In other words, the very ambition of our world today is no different than that of the ancient king, to create a society and kingdom that will last forever. This quote gets right to the heart of the issue. The thought of establishing the empire and a dynasty that should endure forever appealed very strongly to the mighty ruler. With an enthusiasm born of boundless ambition and selfish pride, he entered into counsel with his wise men as to how to bring this about. The wise men of the world today are likewise stumbling over themselves, wondering how sustainability can be achieved. And the answer to this question is revealed to the king through the event that was about to take place. After the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? We read this, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. For seven times, meaning for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was a castaway, separated from his people and his kingdom. There is some archaeological evidence that appears to corroborate the king's experience as well. The British Museum has some discernible fragments of a cuneiform tablet which says about the king that life appeared of no value to him, and he does not show love to son or daughter, and that for him, family and clan does not exist. This comes from the Babylonian Historical Library texts by A.K. Grayson, pages 88 through 92. 
During the course of his seven years, the pride of the selfish king was laid in the dust. But it was also because of this experience, Nebuchadnezzar became a changed man. And in the Bible, his own words are recorded. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. What an incredible change of heart, but did you catch the significance of what the king said? The very object of sustainability to which he had bent all of his wealth and all of his power and all the abilities of the kingdom's wisest men, he now attributed to the kingdom of God. He writes, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Through this experience, Nebuchadnezzar had become a selfless man. Instead of attributing his honor and greatness and power to himself as before, he now credited God entirely. The Bible does not give us any additional insight into the experience of Nebuchadnezzar or what specific revelation or epiphany he had that so profoundly changed his heart. But I suspect that through this experience, God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar the only sustainable thing that would allow a kingdom to last forever. I wonder if God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar that unlike the kingdom of Babylon, the sole principle that permeates God's kingdom and all of its inhabitants is a selfless love for God and one another. I wonder if in his mercy God didn't reveal to the king the secret to the very mystery he spent his life trying to solve, and that secret of sustainability was made clear to his mind. That the sustainability of any kingdom or society is not to be found in its gold or its riches or pride or power, but in the selfless motives of its citizens. I wonder if it wasn't this revelation that gave an unutterable joy to the king's heart and prompted him to speak these words and honor him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom from generation to generation. Babylon, with all its power and magnificence, the like of which our world has never since beheld, power and magnificence, which to the people of that day seemed so stable and enduring, how completely has it passed away? As the flower of the grass, it has perished. So perished the Medo-Persian kingdom and the kingdoms of Grecia and Rome, and so perishes all that has not God for its foundation. Only that which is bound up with his purpose and expresses his character can endure. His principles are the only steadfast things our world knows. The principle of selflessness is the only steadfast thing our world knows, meaning selflessness is the only sustainable thing our world knows. The fall of Babylon is but one of a string of lessons that prove in the scope of this great controversy that a government or society based on selfish principles will always topple and that only selflessness can endure the tests of time. The pulse and heartbeat of our world today is in lockstep with ancient Babylon. The one principle able to ensure the sustainability of mankind is the one thing nobody wants, and the name of the only hero able to rescue mankind from selfishness has become a curse word that flies unrestrained from the lips of the fallen race. Mankind is doomed without Christ, but if there is hope for Nebuchadnezzar, then there is hope for each of us. The story of Job and Nebuchadnezzar are interesting. Both are stories of rich men. One was the only selfless man left on earth, and the other was perhaps the most selfish man on earth. But both men lost everything they had for a season to try them and test them. Through their trials, Job stood strong and remained unchanged, while Nebuchadnezzar was changed. Selfless love has both the power to keep our hearts and the power to change them. Selfish aspirations, desires, and pleasures are no match for the power of love. Whether a common man or a haughty king, if we allow the power of God to change us, he will consume away the selfish pride within us and fit us to be members of his kingdom like Job and Nebuchadnezzar. Their battles with self were very different, and yet both resulted in victories for the kingdom of selfless love that shall have no end. Their experiences are written for our admonition, and their victories are God's assurance to us that his promise to cleanse us of selfishness he is able to perform.
Esther walked uninvited into the king's presence on penalty of death in order to save her people and said, if I perish, I perish. Moses asked God to blot his name out of the book of life if it meant others could be saved. A widow and her son about to die selflessly gave Elijah their last morsel of bread. Over and over again throughout the Old Testament are set before us stories of self-sacrifice and benevolence. Though God has had faithful servants who have mightily contended with the power of self-exaltation, self-preservation, and selfish lusts, the earth still remained the legal territory of a foreign invader. There was not found among all the inhabitants of the earth a man or woman who was completely untainted by selfishness. And unless one such faithful soul upon the earth could be found, the planet and its inhabitants would remain under the legal jurisdiction of the great deceiver. In vision, John saw the gravity of this predicament. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? This book, with the seven seals, is the title and deed to planet Earth. This helps us to understand John's desperation when he wrote, No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. There was not a man upon the earth that had not fallen under the power of selfishness. And therefore, there was not a worthy soul to contest Satan's rightful claim to the earth or the human race. This hopeless prospect is what brought John to tears. As he said, I wept much. But even thousands of years into this war, this story is still far from over. John was not left in despair. While yet in his tears, a voice spoke to him. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. God has sent the Lamb of God, an advocate, a deliverer, a good shepherd, a judge, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Rose of Sharon, the Redeemer, the Messiah, and the only begotten Son of God. Selfless love made manifest in human flesh. Jesus will alone contend with the serpent over the inheritance of the earth and for the souls that live upon it. The next conflict in the great controversy is the most significant of them all. The greatest demonstration of selflessness and the greatest demonstration of selfishness are both about to clash in a single moment in time. As we move 601 years into the future, we come to the year 31 AD. Satan has accused God of selfishness and laid claim to the earth. Now, with the Son of God in human flesh, Lucifer, who was made full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, will bend all his power and perfection of intellect to prove that God is selfish, to subvert the mission of the Messiah and the salvation of man by getting Jesus to commit a single selfish act. The story of the crucifixion you may know, but what was happening at that time in realms unseen you may have never heard. So join me in episode 3 of Selfless as we pull back the celestial curtains of the great controversy at the cross.